Thank you. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce the next speaker, David Burlow. Uh, and I must say, uh, I met him a few weeks ago. Uh, he was speaking to my students, and they were so impressed with his talk. They asked me, teacher, did he invent the internet? <laughs> and I was thinking, I didn't answer because I was very proud that they thought that I know who <laughs> invented the internet. But this is why we have this talk before lunch, after you can have a glass of wine, but keep your mind sharp and welcome David. Who's the drummer? So first of all, I want to compliment the organizers and thank them for um, giving me this opportunity to talk about something I, I typically uh, have sort of studied for a long time, but didn't really have much time to do anything about. And uh, as the situation has changed with indigenous languages and uh, the technology that we have to represent it, I thought it would be a good idea to talk about it now because uh, the technology that we're getting to the point with is uh, becoming extremely powerful compared to what it was when I came into the industry. And so I wanted to start talking about a little bit. Um, the, uh, the time period is sort of divided by these three things. Uh, we started in caves and then we moved to pages and now we're in screens. And in between the first and the third thing, uh, the first and the second thing is writing. Mm -hmm. And then between the second and third thing is uh, movable type. So we start here and uh, these are, uh, you put your hand on the wall, you spit all around, and that's what it's all about until someone asks, I imagine, when do I stop spitting? because that's the background. And this is a question that still plagues us today. Where does the white space end in the typeface? Uh, vertically and horizontally, and when it starts to mix with things. So we have this question going on, and Adrian Frutiger uh, wrote a couple of very famous quotes about this when we were moving from uh, analog to digital about how he knew what was gonna happen when he put his pen to the paper, but he didn't know what was gonna happen after that. And that considered him a lot because of the in important relationship between the two of them. And I think that that's something that people today read those quotes and they don't quite understand what he was talking about. So it's important to understand that as type designers started to lose the capability of knowing where their, what their type was going to be used for, uh, including the size and the spacing and, uh, and the word space and everything. We lost uh, control of that starting in the 1970s. Um, so, it, and it continues today that we have these issues to deal with. And the, the other thing that I want to say about these is that they're all unique, and yet because of the method, they all look very much, have a similarity that you can sort of tell what it is like. And this is going on all over the world in caves that are so distantly separated that they, they couldn't have really seen it. Um, uh, very easily, if you lived in South America, this was going on uh, well, quite a long time ago, and it was also going on here in the south of France, which is where I first ran into this when I get to, got to do a tour of uh, this, the cave uh, at Peshmerel, which is still open. It's one of the ones that are open. You just can't breathe when you're in there. So um, the caves were where we started to have uh, a culture uh, development and I use these three stops along the way with things in between where I've, I've uh, named, you know, the first, the first tools that they had was a, was a blowgun um, and the technology was spitting. And out of this, they had some form of language that uh, they used alongside this. But we really don't know what that is. Um, so, and then everyone knows that what ended prehistory was writing. And with writing, we start to see the relationships between cultures that do have a, a script 
and uh, talking about the cultures that don't have a script. And if you think about it today, we have lots of cultures that surround areas that don't have a script. And this is the opposite of we, what we started out with, was a culture that had a script that was surrounded by cultures that didn't have one. So um, uh, this was something that brought new cultures into, uh, into the use of scripts and new words and things. And, and as things started to evolve, uh, we, we got to the point where we started having uh, trade that was based on um, people's ability to move around out of their caves. And we started to have the need to have labels for stuff and recording them and how uh, they arranged, they began to arrange their recordings so that there was a common way of, of reading them. Um, even if it was a very small population of people who were reading them, uh, they needed to communicate it over distances uh, that were quite great for the time, uh, uh, sp specifically in the, the Middle Eastern and the, uh, the land between the rivers and Anatolia. Uh, there was a tremendous amount of trade and that, and that spread out all over, uh, I believe, from uh, India to England. So um, uh, the, the thing in the middle is actually uh, believed to have been a label with a hole in it so that you could attach it to something else. And this is uh, one of the things that we still use today. It does, they don't quite look like that, but we still have these, these tags. I've got one on the back of my shirt here. And um, we make, we, 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 we've made an entire, set of formats that, that is based on those labels that people use for various things that has come forward from that time. So that's pretty much the, the, the oldest format we have is the label. And um, eventually this trade required laws uh, to govern it so that people knew uh, what was happening. This is from Crete. Uh, it's kind of like they built a cave wall and then started you know, writing the, the laws on the wall and almost every culture that got into trade then got into the laws that governed those things. And uh, we still have that to today for some extent. And over m several millennium going beyond that, uh, uh, we started to get more formats than uh, clay. Clay was much better in some ways than than anything you see here because it had an undo function. You could actually put water on it and wipe something out and then redo it. And uh, it, uh, this happened in manuscripts and, and other things. But even before we started printing, we had, a pre we had presses and we started using that press to do various things besides making wine. Uh, people also stamped leather and, and did other things with presses that, that sort of made it easier for people to start seeing what else you could do with these, these uh, letter things. Um, and in Western culture and with many others, even given the same script and the same tools, uh, writing styles began to diverge under the influence of a religious practice or material supplies, maybe perhaps because of the architecture that they were working with or just they had different ways of thinking about things. So uh, we're now here. Um, uh, there was, uh, just before type was invented and uh, long after the blowgun was relocated back to hunting, cultures settled, settled in the Eurasian country, uh, continent had developed writing in a range of styles, and formats and materials for communicating over distance and across cultures. And uh, an important part of this uh, all along uh, since the cave times is that children could do it. So that children could do these things and learn. And um, we have evidence from the cave that they learned uh, to draw. Um, then type um, would never have happened, I think, unless there was a huge demand for things because it was the, the, the scriptoriums were filled and uh, copyists were busy all the time, and uh, movable type made copying at the level of a character. 
uh, possible. That's the fundamental thing about it to me, is that you can take a letter and make lots of copies of it, and then you can assemble them into something that, that works well. And once the, 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 the uh, other people, not Gutenberg himself, uh, had uh, found the proper uh, system for uh, essentially it's understanding the metallurgy so that you're using harder materials to mark and make in softer materials and then you're using even softer material to make the type is something that I, mean, I don't know how many people even understand that today uh, because the technology has come and gone but that was an incredibly important step for, for type development. And what we also start to see is people starting to advertise by making pictures of the fact that they can do this. Uh, and this had come with, uh, you know, we have pictures of people writing and uh, being scribes from before that, and this is a natural thing forward. And you can see in this little tiny person coming and helping that there were children involved in this process even then. And eventually, um, uh, this led to lots of books. Within 50 years of Gutenberg, there were bookshops uh, spreading out over Europe. And here in Paris, there were quite a few of them. Example, and this is from the Plantin Moretus Museum. And you can see a lot of the original uh, authors of these things uh, got busted. You see their busts there. And they were put into uh, the new scripts, despite they were, the fact that they were written in different languages. And then people became interested in the languages that they were written in, and uh, we started to have uh, multi-script uses in single documents. <clears throat> so, uh, again, in Western culture, given the same tool set and the same uh, process, we got started to have different designs of, the, of, of typefaces. Uh, that broke away from the original black letter uh, in fairly complex ways and for different reasons. But um, by the time uh, we uh, got to the point where there were lots of them, you could go to a shop and buy type. And then, uh, although the original process were a little bit too complicated for children, the, this uh, letter press was not. Uh, when I was a child, uh, in the Cub Scouts, you could earn a badge for this. I decided inside to, instead to make bows and arrows, um, but you could get a badge for doing letterpress typography when I was 12 or 13. Type also began. Can you hear me? Oh, it's for the online feed? Sorry, online people. Can you hear me? Yeah, so anyways, type also began a divide that lasted to probably the digital age for scripts that were just not happy with the matrix uh, that they were being put in. While in the West, it became necessary to find or train people who could set type very quickly. Um, and they had contests for this, but uh, eventually it became clear that some amount of mechanism uh, was gonna have to help with this. And um, so this is where we sort of get to the part that a lot more people know about. This is one of the, the uh, competitors uh, for a, a typesetting system. It's called the Page Typesetter. Uh, it's most famous for the fact that uh, Mark Twain uh, invested the equivalent today of $7 million in, in this machine, and uh, it had some problems. Uh, it, it was modeled after a human arm that would take the type out of a box and put it in the right place and then something, another one would probably put it back or something. But it needed two operators on each side of it to keep the oil going into it or it would freeze up and, and bad things would happen. And there's one left in Massachusetts. The other ones have gone to scrap. But uh, this was the winner. Um, the linotype machine was, it was com competing against the linotype machine and the linotype machine had an important piece well, that we now recognize as a keyboard, and uh, a single person could operate it, and it was an incredibly successful thing. Uh, that uh, It's the place, first place I went to work, uh, but these were long gone by then. So uh, the mechanical uh, change 
uh, was very limiting on the number of scripts for which it was appropriate. While many people were uh, are aware of the stylistic limitations and the technical limitations that were pr pr placed on Latin type and its relatives, uh, uh, some other styles like Arabic were very difficult, if not hard to create for metal type. And uh, in some ways, we, uh, you know, with open type features that we have now, there's still a lot of stuff you can't do in Arabic. Uh, but we also start to see a powerful list of technologies that are developing with, um, with me mechanical type uh, where um, somebody must have noticed that a wheel with a mark on the bottom of it traveling around the road makes a mark as it goes along and so the rotary press was involved. Uh, it was invented uh, in, in patented in several places to speed up the process of production of, of printing and electricity started to move into the world of, uh, and, and specifically into typesetting. And uh, the linotype machine and other machines that were invented had a primitive form of programming uh, where there was a key on the bottom of every matrix so that when the type was being uh, finished, being used, it could be put away. And as somebody who uh, studied and worked in letterpress for a while, any of any uh, others of you know that putting the type away takes a lot of time that you don't want to have. So that was a huge part of that. And of course, the keyboard uh, that's been with us ever since uh, came in at that time. And then I was sort of was beginning to jump forward so that we don't run out of time, even though I don't know how much time I started with. Um, the uh, uh, There were several te technologies between uh, metal and the modern idea of digital type that uh, did open up possibilities for other scripts like uh, the photo photographic processes made some things work better um, um, and early digital although it was concentrated in the hands of Latin developers or Western European developers I should say uh, there was a tremendous amount of interest in how to move forward out of the physical and into the, the computer. And um, the early computers were uh, very, very low resolution. Uh, an example of, of something that was about 50 pixels tall is on the left of the screen here. And uh, anything much smaller than that had to be manually edited uh, for, for quite a while. And um, that produced a uh, situation where the fonts that were made were specific to the resolution of the screen, which was basically impossible to deal with uh, with the internet, which launched in 1994. And so um, we were kind of confined for a very long time uh, to uh, uh, a small number of typefaces that everybody in the world had to use, and very few non-Latin typefaces that were around. So, um, Adobe Type Manager uh, and TrueType started competing with ways for ways of doing the, doing better rendering on the screen for low-resolution devices and uh, 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 basically color fonts. This is what I'm showing here is black and white, but the real implementations of these all use various shades of color to uh, show uh, the some of the details of type, but you still were limited in how much stylistic diversity you could use on screens because there wasn't that much resolution. And then um, uh, when TrueType was adopted by Microsoft, uh, basically both Apple and Microsoft began to leave most of their bitmaps behind. The major operating systems of the day were ready to support the browsers of Web 1.0 because they had these scalable fonts that you didn't need to supply a specific resolution for them. Um, and that sort of got people thinking that type was scalable, uh, was entirely scalable. Um, but for uh, type designers, uh, had a, we, we just traded our old challenges for new challenges. So on the left, you see a range of sizes. And if a user would, for example, specify 16 point, it could be any one of those fonts because of the resolution 
of the device that they were using and uh, with zoom factors that they could use when they were looking at it. So the type designer really didn't know what size it was going to be. And in the middle, you see that the type designer was not really going to know what color it was going to be or what the background was going to be. And um, then eventually we were saved by uh, high resolution from certain things, but not quite from everything. Um, uh, as, as small devices, uh, mobile devices, <clears throat> began to be able to show uh, fine um, details of type. Uh, you could actually use a typeface like Optima or Palatino that looked completely different in high resolution than it does in low resolution. And so um, we get up to the present where we have this uh, I call it a suite or a bundle of technologies that is extremely powerful today as far as uh, how it can affect type and typography and communications. We have user interfaces, we have digital fonts, we have Unicode, we have networking, we have high resolution screens, we have open type features and color fonts and stylistic variations. And it's sort of brought us to what I call reading 4.0 which is basically that there are billions and billions of people who are literate and they are looking for things to read. And so we have a tremendous, uh, 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 both uh, 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 audience and a significantly larger responsibility to make sure that we uh, make it so that reading is something that people can do not only with the scripts that they have, but they're comfortable with whatever challenges they have for age or distance or whatever it is. But in the meantime, um, we've developed all these formats, these formats, these ways that we compose things. And the, what I think of as the containers of our type have been developed based on uh, primarily on the ideas of Western culture and Western typography and what's good for those. Um, and so I started thinking um, as I'm going forward for some open source projects for Google that involve uh, a second generation of, uh, of uh, uh, the variations technology, uh, I've been asked to um, define all of the parametric axes, uh, parametric axes to me are uh, a variation axis that just controls and isolates one thing about uh, type, like the, uh, the alignment of the lowercase or the internal white space of a glyph, so that you can have these things separated out and then you can blend them together uh, to make various things. And uh, with AVAR1, this was not impossible. This was not AVAR is a table that sort of makes it so that you can distort the design space and control it better. Um, uh, but the first version of that was basically a very uh, Adobe multiple masters like thing. And so when I started working with variables, I wanted to sort of break out of that mold. And I immediately designed uh, Amstelvar that was. Uh, uh, a typeface that ended up having to be in both parametric axes and registered axes because I couldn't blend them as I wanted to. And so it got to be very large and also uh, very dangerous to use. Uh, as Lawrence Penny once pointed out, there are more crazy styles in it than regular styles. But I also made uh, Decovar, which was all crazy styles except for the default, um, to demonstrate that there were things that you could do that were arbitrary, that people wanted to play with, but there were also things that were about the finessing of the typography uh, for various things, including different colors and working with different languages and all that stuff. Uh, but we haven't made any progress with the owners of the specification for so long that we've just had to go ahead and do what we think is right for everybody else. So. Um, I started to get into this other area about how you sort of look at these things and uh, uh, some of the uh, smart people that I work with, including uh, Santiago Orozco and Miguel Escamila, started working on uh, an extension of the Latin, Latin alphabet, 
for um, all the indigenous languages in Mexico, uh, which are quite diverse and interesting to look at. Um, and uh, it's very important to do this work to save the languages. People should not have to wait until a script is developed and the children learn it and do all that stuff to preserve the language. So step one is preserving the language, and if it's appropriate to make a script, then uh, as long as you make it so the ch child can learn it, it's going to be just fine. Um, so in, I came across this problem when I started to have to define all of the uh, uh, the parametric axes that you needed for the farthest extension of Latin that there is, which includes uh, many, many languages uh, uh, from Mexico and Africa, and uh, all every continent has has uh, a certain amount of uh, taking the Latin accent and uh, Latin Latin typefaces, uh, Latin script, and making it possible to uh, use it for another language. And uh, Latin has been doing this since the beginning. We all know about accented characters. We know we're adding glyphs to it. And uh, for, for, for uh, when I came into the business, it was for NATO. And now it's for everybody, oh. Um, and so I started looking at that. And that is what I plan to work on uh, for some time um, to make uh, clear that we, we aren't going to be limited to the major languages because there's a significant uh, danger in that now that we're going forward with AI. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, David. Uh, we will have a lunch and come back. I think the first talk is at 3 o'clock. Okay, thank you.